Hi everyone, welcome back. Today we're going to travel to the Middle Ages, to the Dark Ages. So today we've come to see this very old church, um, this Norman um, Anglo-Saxon church um, that was built in 1050. This church is very, very famous and very special um, because it has what's believed to be the oldest frescoes in the country. Um, of course, depicting religious scenes, as you'd expect uh, from a church. As I've said, they were they were painted around um, 11, sort of 1100s, maybe um, mid mid 12th century. So, what looks like a very simple whitewashed church was actually very typical of the of the era. Now, there used to be there used to be a door here, you can see, um, which subsequently was filled in. Um, and yeah, the church structure is indeed very, very simple. So it really is just made out of two parts. So you've got the nave, so which is the main part of the church, and then you've got the chancel there. So that's where the altar is. So unlike with the bigger, churches of the time you would have transepts protruding from each side and it to form a cross if you were to look at it from from above um, but obviously yeah this this was just a small small church however I find it absolutely marvelous especially some of the features and some of the history that we can see um, it sort of makes you feel a little bit spooky especially some aspects of it you can see the original windows, they're just tiny slits in the wall because um, obviously before before glass was widely available, windows would have been absolutely tiny um, and then you can see lancet windows being added later on, sort of the proper um, church-like windows that we'd expect to see um, and, and the, um, the, the turret that was added in Victorian times, so really would have been a really, really simple style of a church. Now, of course, the frescoes are very rare and, and this is a true treasure that, that this church harbours. However, there is one aspect of history, of, of, of history of church and religion um, that, that I find absolutely, it just sends shivers down my spine. Um, so, and you can actually see this, uh, you can see evidence of that fairly horrid um, tradition, I'd say, um, here in the wall of this church. And as you approached it, you probably wouldn't understand what, what it is and why it was there. Um, it's sort of a, it, it's a very deep, almost like a, like a, like a cavern, like a hole, um, pointing towards the altar. So back in those times, obviously we know how deeply religious people were. Um, there wasn't much of a role for women in, in, in the clergy. Um, obviously we had nuns, and nuns often came from fairly um, sort of well-off backgrounds. Um, so you couldn't just become a nun if, if you had no money, no um, sort of upbringing um, or, or money or a family that could um, point you in that direction. Um, now there was a, a slightly more sinister way of dedicating your life to the church. Um, and this, this still thing relates exactly to that. If you were a really devout Christian, um, and mainly a woman, um, you could become what was called an anchoress. Now, there were anchorites, um, so men also occasionally became, um, took that part, um, but more than two-thirds of, of, of them were women. Anchoresses, or anchorites, were placed in a small, tiny cell and they were actually walled in, so anchored to the church so that they could not get out. They had to permanently live this simple ascetic life, um, this simple existence, literally anchored to the church. So anchor hold was exactly that place, the cell where the anchoress would live and potentially die. Um, it, it really, I, I don't know how common it would have been for an anchoress to escape, to, to, to exit that existence, because as I said, they would have been literally walled in um, into, into that cell that was um, literally built as part of the church. So anchor hold would have been a very small building, it would have been a small cell um, that literally only had three 
well exits but really just three holes one was the squint and the squint it faced the altar and obviously that way the anchoress could dedicate her life to, to, to prayer to, to the Christ to God and she could see the mass she could see the altar and receive the Eucharist now to the outside um, the anchoress would have a maid who um, would bring a little bit of food and take away any waste um, so there would be a small hole somewhere sort of towards maybe lower part of the um, to the side of the anchor hold um, and and most often there would also be a window so not a very large window but a window facing out facing out to the world um, because actually it was known that some anchoresses were held in high regard and it was believed that because they dedicated their life to God they could actually offer you some good advice and wisdom that they would have gathered through that sort of existence. There were entire manuals written on how anchoress life it should have been structured and, and how you, you, you would become and, and, and would be a good anchoress. Um, now there were certain instructions what you should do, um, what you shouldn't wear, um, to, to, to the sort of slightly ridiculous that the window um, the anchor hold had out facing out of the world shouldn't be too large for the fear of that becoming a brothel. However, they didn't really have very much contact with the outside world and, and, and that contact was discouraged. Um, so, so much so um, that it would have been a very, very difficult existence, more of a prison-like existence. Um, and, and make no mistake, <laughs> they, they didn't live that long. Although there is written evidence of anchoresses living for something like 20 years in an anchor hold and, and dying there and, and sometimes actually um, remains would, would still be that their remains would be buried in that same spot where their anchor hold would have been. Slightly further here along the same wall uh, we can see that there, there used to be a door, there used to be a doorway here um, like another exit. Some people speculate that there would be a special exit for the burials and obviously that this this door it faces onto the graveyard um, there is no yew tree currently growing here but obviously they were very very popular they were very important to the fabric of, of the graveyard and the church and the belief was you would actually carry the dead body under a yew tree um, to sort of offer that protection um, and ward off any evil spirits um, and this um, obviously this door does indeed face um, face the graveyard now you might wonder why is the ground raised sort of what, what why would they build the foundations of the church lower than than the graveyard nearby sort of why would it be like that would would they build it in a ditch and it's actually not like that at all and i find it slightly creepy that the real reason why um and that's because of subsequent burials um the, the graves essentially would raise the ground a little bit and that's why you'll see that quite often with churches um that the the foundation appears to be in a sort of a ditch of sorts um, but yeah the reason is actually um, the graves. One might wonder is that why there are holes opening up um, here in the ground as if the, um, the dead bodies are decaying further and, and releasing this ground that they've raised over years. So let's see whether we can go in inside. Really heavy and old door that you'd be forgiven to think that the place was closed so much so that there's a, a sign that it's open and if you um if you try and twist it hard enough it does open very nice and cool in here and as we enter inside we realize that we're lucky because not all the churches are open nowadays now this, being the Church of St. Bottle, he's actually the saint of wayfarers. So it's only suited that you can come and visit this church. The entire walls were covered in these early drawings, these frescoes. So as with all churches, of course, the scenes were religious. But here with the corner closest to the door, we can spot St. George what initially was thought to be a scene where he's slaying the dragon which is normally what saint george is um, portrayed to do but actually 
later it was realised that this is more a crusader type scene. Um, and I guess my interpretation would be he's later sort of elevated to a status of a saint. And there also we can see some early, early scenes from um, early life of Christ. They're on a horse. So to me, the most fascinating painting in this church is actually Adam and Eve. And you will know why when I show it to you. Have a look at that. Isn't that absolutely extraordinary? So those who know quite a bit about early art, so um, sort of early Anglo-Saxon art, um, will sort of recognize this as being a very typical style. Um, it always, it, it's, I, I find it slightly weird um, the way they chose to depict human body. Um, if you see the ribs are particularly visible, um, you see these bellies sort of protruding and almost being separate part of the body. Um, you see Eve's breasts and, and Adam's muscles um, and the legs, they sort of look very skinny and, and, and you, can, you can tell apart every single muscle, every single tendon. Um, and obviously the faces are highly stylized to a point where you can hardly tell which one's a man and which one's a woman. Now, you might think it's odd, this kind of style, but actually, if you, um, if you ever look at other paintings of the era, that doesn't seem to be that unusual. So, as I've said, this is an Anglo-Saxon times church, but actually, so this would be an equivalent um, of what Byzantine art was in the rest of Europe. And if you look at this, um, this example from Sicily, um, this mosaic, you'll see a very, very similar um, representation of human body. Again, this, this extreme overemphasis on the, um, on the ribs, on the belly, it's almost like a dissecting the body. Um, that was very, very popular in that time. Now, um, this, um, if, you, if you look at this example here, um, this is from an old manuscript, and actually, this is from 900, 970 AD. Um, and again, you can see the same kind of almost creepy depiction of human body. Um, and it's a lot earlier. So if, if you think that this church, um, these drawings would have been added something around sort of the 1100s, so in the 12th century. Um, so you can see how that art, it persisted, that sort of drawing. So some people will say that these are, that these are Romanesque drawings, um, but they just don't have that fluidity. For me, I see Byzantine art all over in, in its primitive nature, uh, but also very, very fascinating. And, and in fact, if you, <laughs> if, if you look at some more modern examples, can you see a similarity <laughs> here with them, um, with Matisse? And definitely, most definitely, Picasso. Um, this painting in particular, Girl Before a Mirror, um, it's almost replicating um, this type of drawing. Um, and I don't know if it's making fun of it or, or actually it's enjoying it very much. And just below, we can see yet another drawing in that exactly same sort of style. Again, ribs protruding and these bellies as if they're just flopping down. Um, really pronounced. It's, it's hard to tell what this scene was, um, potentially another continuation of um, Adam and Eve, um, because normally these sort of frescoes, they just continue to tell a story, um, but we can't quite tell what this was. So just so over on the other side of the arch, um, we can see here Eve, she's milking a cow or some kind of um, an animal. Um, there and I sort of wonder is that Adam peeping through <laughs> peeping through the bushes um, which is just so fascinating there 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 he is with his big eyes and as we travel closer to the altar so essentially closer to God um, we see here a scene of the Last Supper 
again, you can just see the legs under the table and, and all the apostles, um, you can't quite make out what they would have been eating though. I mean, this, this almost looks like a, like a loaf of bread or something like that. Um, and I believe that was a crucifixion scene, but it's quite, it's not quite obvious. Um, um, it's only because I read, read about this. Now this, if we wonder where that squint would have come through in relation to the interior, um, curiously there is actually a cupboard here. <laughs> and it makes you wonder whether that was sort of, um, whether that's masking something. And in fact, there are no paintings right in this place. Um, it, the, the wall sort of looks a little bit almost mouldy, almost there's, there's something seeping through. Um, and so it may well be that this would have come through um, well, perhaps here, because we see clearly there's a there's this patch, um, and whether that's been patched up um, because something was falling through, or, or whether that's to do with all this, um, you know, all these indentations um, to do with um, with a squint of the anchoress. The frescoes are also quite famous locally because they're believed to have been painted by what's known as the Lewis Group, and Lewis is one of the towns here locally as well in the south. Um, and so you do encounter some similar style um, of a fresco around, and as I've said, they don't easily survive, and, and mainly because they get overpainted um, by other, other art or, or, or just sort of painting the walls of the church. The location of this church is also quite interesting because there are a lot of Roman, um, both a Roman road, there's a Roman villa um, in the vicinity and in fact some of the stones um, from the sort of Roman era and, and the Roman cut, they were reused in building this church. So that would have been 500 years later. And before we wave goodbye to this church, let's talk about St. Botolph. So this is the saint um, to whom this church was dedicated. St. Botolph was incredibly popular when it came to churches and he was, he was obviously very prominent at the time when he was alive, as in he, he managed to drain these marshes and, and build a church. Um, so he was indeed quite a prominent figure then. Um, but he didn't become the saint, um, the, the patron of, all, of wayfarers um, and travellers because he did all this traveling when he was when he was alive when he was young no apparently um it's because his relics his remains were circulated and, and traveled so widely <laughs> as relics used to be really popular back in the day that's why he became the patron um of of all of, of wayfarers and all travelers <laughs> And there are about 70 churches, or seven zero, in the UK dedicated to St. Botolph. So thank you for joining me in this trip to the dark ages, and hopefully it wasn't all dark and gloomy. See you soon. Take care. Bye.